I'm Georgette Knoll with the League of Women Voters ABC, which covers Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids, Champlin, and surrounding areas. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Each year, the League of Women Voters of Minnesota Action Committee recommends legislation for members to follow and support. The recommended bills are supported by League positions. Only after in-depth study and, and member consensus does the League of Women Voters develop positions that are used to advocate for change in legislation and policy. One recommended legislative issue during the just ending session involved the need to protect Minnesota children. The League of Women Voter U.S. position supports policies and programs that promote the well-being and de the well-being development and safety of all children. The League of Women Voter Minnesota position went one step further and in addition supports adequate staffing and resources for child protection. It was with these positions in mind that the League of Women Voters supported the most recent legislative efforts. To help us understand the, legis the legislation and the issues that led up to it, we're going to hear a presentation by Rich Gehrman, founder and executive director of Safe Passage for Children in Minnesota. Safe Passage is a Minnesota nonprofit corporation created to protect and improve the well-being of children in child protection, foster care, and public adoption programs. The organization advocates for systemic systemic improvements to Minnesota's child protection and foster care systems. Mr. Gehrman developed expertise in child welfare metrics and best practices in his work for clients which include the Center for the Study of, Policy, of Social Policy, the Ramsey County ACE program, and Growing Home, a Minnesota foster care agency. His background led him to develop the core strategy and resources for safe passage. Mr. Gehrman has also managed projects in federal, state, and county and municipal governments in areas of health, human services, state court administration, higher education, and juvenile justice. He has worked with runaways and street youth. Mr. Gehrman has also served as the Chief Finance and Administrative Officer for the Westchester County New York Department of Social Services, the Maryland Department of Human Services, the City of St. Paul, Minnesota, and Catholic Charities in St. Paul. He is a graduate of Williams College, Harvard Divinity School, and Harvard Business School. In 2014, Mr. Gehrman assisted the Minneapolis Star Tribune in its investigation of child protection. Because of his vast experience, expertise, and knowledge around the issue of child protection, he was appointed to the Governor's Task Force on Child Protection that was formed in October 2014. In March of this year, the task force issued 93 recommendations that the legislature considered during the most recent session. Today, Rich will discuss the recommendations of that task force on child protection and the actions taken by the state legislature in response to the recommendation. Please welcome Mr. Rich Gehrman. Thanks, Georgette. I appreciate it. And um, what I'll do is give some background in terms of what led up to the Governor's Task Force in Child Protection uh, and, uh, and then uh, talk about where we're going from here in terms of following up. Uh, so first let me just uh, set the table in terms of how Minnesota historically has uh, responded to uh, reports of child abuse. Uh, historically we only responded to about 28 or 29 percent of reports that come in. Reports come in from mostly mandated reporters, about 70 percent of the time they're reporters like school teachers and, and physicians and other people required by law to report. And the other 30 percent is uh, citizens, friends, neighbors, people who are aware of a situation. So 29 percent of those calls get a response, meaning a worker goes out and in some form does an assessment or investigation. That compares to 62 percent for states on average nationally. And that means historically 20 or 22,000 children a year who probably should have had someone go out and take a look at the situation didn't get that service and uh, as a result often got reported many times before they finally uh, got someone to, to uh, give them some help. Uh, however, as a result of the recent scrutiny that we'll talk about and the, and the tightening up of standards, those percentages are increasing. We don't know what they are yet, but we hear uh, you know, anecdotal information that uh, in some cases may be doubling or increasing uh, 
by 50 or 60 percent. So that number is shifting in the right direction. So let me just say briefly who we are, who is Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota. Uh, as you indicated, we're an advocacy group and we're a citizen group. We're all volunteer, uh, people who are interested in this issue, concerned about children, um, who uh, are, uh, you know, have, and many of them have had some kind of contact with the child protection system as mandated reporters or guardians ad litem or in some other capacity. So they have a lot of concern about what's happening to children who are victims of child maltreatment. Um, and by child welfare, we basically mean the core public sector programs that respond to uh, child abuse reports and also the foster care system that follows from that. So it's a very uh, focused set of uh, programs. Our mission at Safe Passage is to rebuild the child welfare system in Minnesota so children are safe and reach their full potential. And I think the safe part is fairly self-explanatory, but the full potential uh, bears a little more explanation. Now we'll go into that later when we start talking about outcomes. And then long-term, our vision, and, and in some ways this is similar to the League of Women Voters, uh, long-term we want to make sure that there, there, there is always a group of citizens in Minnesota who consider it their job to be looking out for and watching over victims of child maltreatment. So we want this to be a longer-term citizen engagement uh, opportunity for people. So bringing it down to the level of goals, our goal has been to change uh, child welfare laws and practice and policies uh, so that first of all we measure outcomes for every child. We want to be able to tell if when children get into the child protection system they're doing better or not as a result of the system's response. Uh, and to make child safety secondly uh, and, and well-being the primary uh, response uh, of the system and concern of the system and a third to reinvest in child welfare because there have been many cuts that I will talk about. So if I can, let me talk a little bit in more detail about the program problem uh, that we've had over the years in Minnesota. Uh, we did some research with the uh, Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota and we looked at nearly 100 uh, cases, court cases in Hennepin County. They're called CHIPS cases, Child in Need of Protection and Services, and these are the cases that get all the way through an investigation and into the courts. And some of the things we found, for example, were that many children are reported 10 or 15 or even more times. Uh, often those reports don't get a response, and when they do, uh, the response may not be effective. 70% of children who finally get screened in have gone to what's called a family assessment program. And that was a program originally designed for lower risk cases, but over uh, the period of time it's been in effect, it became more and more uh, a default uh, uh, process where kids went into those uh, family assessment and then they often were offered voluntary services and the family refused the services and the case was closed. So it became kind of a churning and a cycling of children being reported over and over again and then being reported, uh, being um, designated for this uh, voluntary program and then kind of going out the back door. So a lot of cycling through. In fact, only 11% of the families that went into that program in Hennepin County in our research study actually ever got services. Uh, so that'll give you a sense. Also, we found in this that it takes almost four years, 47 months on average for that case to get to court from the time of the original uh, petition. And then 36% of children experienced additional maltreatment while under the protective supervision of the courts. So they weren't safe even when it finally got to the court process. Uh, and then 29%, almost nearly a third of cases, were closed with the same list of high-risk factors that caused the case to be opened in the first place. So this will give you a sense uh, of the futility in many respects of reporting cases uh, uh, for child maltreatment. And it's uh, Hennepin County uh, may not be the same as all the state, all the counties around the state, but there are many similarities from other data that we've obtained. Um, so um, then, uh, as I mentioned, family assessment program was originally intended to, uh, for low-risk cases, um, but as the percent that was, were assigned to that went from 30 to 75 percent, there were many high-risk cases, including hundreds of sexual abuse cases assigned to that every year, and since it's primarily uh, a voluntary program the way it's actually implemented, that means that those children uh, didn't get protected. Um, I, I should say that different counties implemented that different ways, and in some it was less voluntary, but on the whole, uh, there weren't a lot of uh, requirements for families that, that got into that program to follow through on whatever the court uh, required. Um, and then uh, this is also, family assessment is known nationally, the term for it is differential response. And so it's a, a program that has been used uh, by a number of states uh, and has been recently challenged in terms of the research that supported it. 
uh, there are some very credible researchers coming out and saying that uh, that the evaluations have been you know, haven't been as thorough as they should be or as robust, and that the outcomes that were reported for these differential response programs uh, need to be looked at more carefully. Uh, then that's, so that's the program problem in terms of how we implement. In terms of resources, many of you know, many of your uh, members will know that Minnesota is a state-supervised, locally administered uh, state in terms of uh, many social services and mental health programs. So that means that uh, the counties actually run the program, whereas in about 40 states this, it is run directly by the state. So this means, and some counties have combined social services, but basically there's um, 85 or 86 different ways of doing business out there because there's two tribes and some counties have combined, so there's about 84 uh, county agencies. Uh, and each of them has over time developed their own way of doing business. That's one piece of the issue structurally. Uh, secondly, Minnesota has been the second lowest state nationally in terms of how much the state contributes to child welfare programs. Uh, and uh, so that is partly because we're a state supervised county run system, so the state uh, doesn't manage the program. But even of those ones where the state just contributes to the program, we're the second lowest. So that means counties have paid for most of the services, uh, and as the state has cut uh, money over the years, they've cut about $25 million out of their contribution since 2002. More and more of the burden has gone on the counties, and they have other pressures on their tax base, and so the program has been cut. It's difficult to know exactly how much just because it's so spread out, but it's been cut substantially. And then there have been uh, federal uh, and county cuts on top of the state cuts. So it's been about a $41 million cut a year. Uh, in these programs out of a total budget of about maybe 340 million, so a very substantial reduction. Um, so this year, and we'll talk more about what happened in the budget, but um, they, um, the legislature, as of um, the day before yesterday when the session ended, had approved a significant new funding for the counties. And uh, so that uh, is, includes, uh, it's 52 million and it's 52.5 million for the biennium. That comes out on an annual basis to about $22 million for counties, earmarked for counties, which they can use to replenish their staff or rebuild their support services. And then $3 million a year uh, for pilot projects to address racial disparities. As many uh, people are aware, Minnesota has uh, great racial disparities generally uh, in terms of services and education. In child protection, uh, we're about twice as, uh, we have twice as great a disparity between in terms of the number of children in the system uh, for African Americans uh, as the average state and about four times as many for Native Americans. So there's, we have a much worse uh, disparity gap than the average state. So the three million a year will go towards uh, some pilot projects, as I said, and some research to figure out what's working elsewhere so we can begin to tackle that issue. And then uh, about a million a quarter a year for new staff for the State Department of Human Services. And that's good because it's very difficult to get more money for state staff, but the way that Minnesota has worked over the years, the state has really not played a strong role in terms of oversight of the counties and of the program, partly because they didn't have the staff and it was part, partly just the way that the corporate culture developed on this program. Uh, but uh, that means that there haven't been sufficient checks and balances in the system on counties uh, to make sure that they're, they're working uh, appropriately. So um, this will help them to develop a quality assurance program or to strengthen the one that they have to make sure the cases are being screened in appropriately and handled responsibly, uh, expand uh, the fatality review reporting process, um, improve training, and then there'll be a big process to kind of really totally rethink the guidelines for what uh, is considered child maltreatment in Minnesota. Uh, so those are the big pieces of the budget, uh, more money for the counties, racial disparities, and the state. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, the problem with uh, the philosophical problem, if you will, uh, with this family assessment approach. Uh, and just to uh, give a couple of specifics about how that works, uh, the traditional response is an investigation, and that means that someone goes out and does uh, kind of a forensic investigation to figure out if abuse or, or neglect happened, and then there's a finding, and if there's a finding that it did happen, it goes into a central registry, and uh, if it's serious enough, it goes to court. That's the traditional track. Family assessment um, doesn't, is built around the concept that if you can get families to work with you more cooperatively, then you can keep out of the courts and things will go better. Um, but there haven't been, a, there's been kind of a carrot but no stick in, in that. There hasn't been any real uh, accountability for parents to actually follow through. So parts of that are, for example, um, there 
workers were discouraged from uh, doing any collateral contact. So if you got a call from a teacher that we were concerned, then you would not uh, be, uh, you would not be encouraged to talk to the school nurse or to a therapist or to some other professional involved with the family. So that really uh, is sort of like we don't want to know all the things that happened. It was kind of deliberately avoiding finding out information that affected the, the safety of the child. Um, a second piece of this is that the first step in the process in family assessment is to sit down with the whole family together, including the alleged perpetrator and the alleged victim or victims. So sit around the kitchen table or in the living room and kind of say, well, what happened? Well, obviously, the children are not going to feel comfortable if something is going on, uh, saying it in that environment. Um, key decisions about cases are made before uh, there's very much information. So there's a, a, this process is a call comes into a screener at a county who's often not a highly trained person, if they think that it uh, is at the level of child maltreatment, they hand it off to a supervisor and maybe a senior worker, and they decide whether to do an investigation or family assessment before they go out and see the family. So there's very little information at that stage. Uh, and as I said, it's used increasingly for high uh, risk cases, which by law required an investigative response. So that's the, the issue, the tension around um, the family assessment program and, and the reason many advocates are involved is their concerns about that. I think many people have heard about the consequences of delaying uh, a response to an abuse situation. Uh, many people are familiar with the uh, adverse childhood experiences research uh, that is out there, uh, but let me just briefly talk about what that is for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, this is research that's been done mostly by the Center for Disease Controls and then uh, in disease control and then kind of spun off to other universities. And uh, it, one of the things it shows is that when children are exposed to severe abuse or neglect, their brains don't develop normally. So if you're at the stage where your brain is kind of turning on to learn language, for example, and it only stays on in that, you know, in that area for a certain period of time, and you're, all of your energy is focused around safety or survival, then you don't learn language properly. And after a certain period of time, your brain goes on to the next stage, and that part of your brain kind of shuts down. And so uh, these, each of these steps is a building block for what happens later. So if children are in a constant period of what's called toxic stress, which means high enough to, to cause this, uh, this to happen, uh, then they don't develop normally. The building blocks aren't there, and it's very difficult to go back and put the pieces together later. It affects things like their IQ. Children lose IQ points uh, year after year if they're in stressful situations, ability to bond with other people, uh, what's called executive function, which basically means self-regulation, self-control, uh, and um, ability to read social cues, all of those things that uh, children learn in the first few years of their life. So that's kind of the background for the system as it has been in Minnesota for the last 20 years or so. So let me just shift and tell you a little bit about how we work in Safe Passage for Children. We simply train volunteers and they go talk to their elected officials, they, do, uh, they talk to members of the public, they do some presentations, generally educating uh, people to, the, to what's going on in child protection. Uh, one of the big advantages of uh, taking all volunteer kind of approaches that children is that uh, legislators will almost always meet with a constituent, and so we've been able uh, through our volunteers to kind of get in front of, you know, at least a third and sometimes more of legislators during each session. Um, in terms of citizen engagement, which is something that I know the league is very interested in, it's a very lean, uh, you know, relatively inexpensive model for doing advocacy work because uh, volunteers volunteer their time. And um, compared to the, the traditional advocacy approach, uh, which is usually based on a think tank, we're about 20% as costly to implement uh, this approach as the traditional strategy. We're nonpartisan and not ideological, uh, so we literally have volunteers from the Tea Party to the Green Party, and we also have support on both sides of the aisle in the legislature. Uh, and it's sustainable. One of the reasons that we did this in my experience in government, I saw many um, uh, child welfare reform efforts that got success for a period of time and then kind of faded away. And the reason for that was that they were all based on a handful of leaders, usually the state commissioner and a few legislators decided that it was time to do something about child welfare. Uh, but then they inevitably moved on to other tasks or they weren't elected or whatever. And so it wasn't sustainable. So we were deliberately looking for a model of engagement that did not have that problem. And that's where you can always renew a volunteer base. Think of, uh, you know, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts or uh, boys uh, or the mentoring programs. Uh, and um, individual volunteers may come and go, but you have the ability to maintain that base. So it's more 
um, sustainable. And then it engages citizens uh, in issues, in our case, a particular issue that benefits the community overall. So very similar to the league in the sense that people aren't there because they're going to get some benefit from their lobbying. They're there because of the kids. So perhaps the most important piece of our long-term strategy is basing uh, the system increasingly on outcomes for children. We want to be able to measure outcomes, and this follows a plan that was originally developed uh, by the federal government, the Children's Bureau of the federal government, uh, and it has now kind of moved to where Chapin Hall, which is a think tank at the University of Chicago, is kind of taking ownership of it, but it has a lot of support in that respect. It's got a lot of uh, people who are very smart have thought through this whole process. Uh, and uh, the basic idea is to do an assessment using a normed instrument when children come into the system, starting with an assessment uh, for trauma, uh, to see what level of trauma it is, and then as you update that over time and re-administer re the assessment, the children's level of trauma should go down. So that's an objective measure of whether the system is actually doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and the plan then is to start with that trauma assessment and then over time to add other measures such as uh, cognitive and physical development and uh, behavioral health and mental health. So this will begin to form a whole package uh, that you can take into court with an individual child that the workers and supervisors can look at to see if what they're doing is working and then you can you know, roll those numbers up to see how a worker, a unit, a county, the state are doing as a whole. So uh, that's uh, based on my experience in government. The one thing that works in terms of motivating people is if you give them a report card on how they're doing relative their, to their peers, or you give one county uh, set of board of uh, county commissioners a report on how they're doing compared to a similar county. People want to get good grades. Nobody wants to get a D on their report card. So it does motivate people, and if you can figure out the right things for them to work on and measure, then they will continuously improve the system. And I believe in it because it's the, the one strategy when I was in government management uh, positions that actually worked. So let me talk about how, what led up to this year's legislative session and what the, um, and what the outcomes of that were. Uh, many uh, of your members will know that there were a series of stories in the Minneapolis Star Tribune uh, on child protection. There were a couple that came out in May of last year and early uh, in, the, in the fall that didn't really go anywhere. But in, around Labor Day, uh, there was a story about a little boy, a four-year-old named Eric Dean. And he was uh, reported uh, on 15 occasions to the child protection authorities in Pope County. Um, child care workers had photos of him. He had been... He had human bite marks, he had black eyes, his, his arm was twisted in a way that it was twisted right out of his socket and broke. Uh, there were clear signs and signals that this was not a kid who was falling, you know, bumping into walls. They were ignored. He was uh, screened in for family assessment twice and then the case was closed without any services. And then he was, uh, ultimately he died. Uh, there were other children as well. Um, there was another a story in a boy named DeMond Reed. Uh, a couple of weeks later, he was four years old. He was found in a closet in his home. He had been kicked. He had been burned down uh, to the bone, and he left in the closet for several days to die, and he had ultimately died from blood poisoning from the burn. Uh, and he had many uh, fractures and other signs of previous trauma. He had been reported six times uh, to child protection. So um, one of the things that we hear is, well, this is all about this one little boy, Eric Dean, you know, who's a kind of a, a little white boy in a rural county, and it doesn't really apply to a lot of other areas of the state or, or communities. Um, but the Star Tribune then did uh, um, stories on all 56 children who had been killed uh, by their caregivers from 2005 on. And by the way, there have been at least eight more since that report came out last fall. Uh, and so this is a systemic problem. It's not about one little boy and an overreaction to that death. So that led the, that story in particular led the governor to appoint the task force on child protection that you mentioned. Uh, and the charge was to review policies and laws and protocols uh, and to come up with ways to improve accountability uh, and to analyze capacity and resources, which basically means is there enough money in the system. And as you mentioned, the final recommendations were released at the end of March. Um, I have to say that there was strong support from the governor for this. And excellent leadership from the Department of Human Services. Uh, they have been, as I have said, kind of playing a fairly light role in this, but they really stepped up. The commissioner and the new assistant commissioner, uh, Jim Koppel, uh, assumed a lot of leadership on this. And Jim Koppel was previously uh, the director of the Children's Defense Fund, so he has an advocacy background. Uh, 
Uh, and that really helped the task force to move forward because we got good leadership from the state level people there. I think the counties were very committed to this family ass assessment program, so they, they really struggled to, uh, you know, to uh, agree to uh, many of the recommendations, but in the end we did work through uh, to come up with a consensus uh, report. Um, so let me tell you what some of the key recommendations from a policy point of view are in practice. First of all, the, um, the primary responsibility, according to law now, will be the safety and well-being of the child as opposed to giving priority to family assessment, which is about family preservation and, and, re, uh, and, and you know, uh, reintegration of families after kids have been in foster care. Secondly, counties have to follow the same guidelines for child abuse and neglect. Historically, the state has put guidelines on which the counties reference, but then they often uh, expanded on them or changed them or adapted them to their counties. And so we had, you know, 80, 87 different ways of doing business around the state. Um, the time required to keep uh, information about screened out reports uh, is going to be increased from one year to five years. So uh, Safe Passage had got legislation, gotten legislation passed the previous year to require counties to keep enough information on cases they screened out so you could see in each county how many children had been reported one, two, three, five, ten, fifteen times. So that was a start, but that uh, got expanded to five years. Um, the commission was required to uh, develop a quality assurance program. Um, counties have to share maltreatment reports consistently with law enforcement and the county attorneys. That was in the books, but it wasn't, um, it was more honored in the breach and the observance, so this was strengthening that requirement. Uh, there was a law that was passed last year that the Department of Human Services sponsored that, re that uh, told counties, uh, told workers that when they were screening a case, they could not look at past reports of child abuse. They had to uh, screen each one based on just the information in that report, which of course meant a lot of cases were screened out where there were patterns that uh, probably should have caused it to be screened in. That was, uh, that was, um, that, that requirement has been abolished and now workers will be required to look at past reports. Um, Increased use of collateral contacts, requiring them instead of requiring they not be used, uh, and developing multi di multidisciplinary teams. So, um, and then we talked about the increased leadership role for the Department of Human Services, so that will be good. So, where do we go from here? I think that um, we are really much further ahead than we expected to be at this point in time because of, the, of these uh, recommendations from the task force. They include all of our stretch goals for what we would have liked to see accomplished by 2018, and those were really stretch goals. But really the Star Tribune series kind of gave a booster rocket to what we have been doing. And, uh, and I think what we had contributed is our volunteers had been down there for at least five years educating legislators about the situation. So they had some point of reference when the Star Tribune series came out and, and the legislators began to say, well, who you know, knows about this issue and who can we talk to? And as did other media outlets and people often referred them to us. So that's how we kind of got in, uh, you know, into the mix in terms of uh, uh, the governor's task force. Um, so a lot of that, as you can see, really was a result of the fact that the volunteers had built up this awareness in the legislature for those years. Um, but implementation, it's really, a lot of this is supposed to be implemented in the next two years, but it's almost, it's like a career's worth of, of uh, recommendation to implement. So um, we are going to have to, our next role is really to stay on top of the implementation, make sure that people don't forget about it, that, the, that it actually gets followed through on it. Uh, and. Um, we also think that the next stage is going to mean focusing on more prevention uh, because we will be bringing many more families into the system as a, result, as a result of tightening up the standards. So in order to really make this work, we're going to have to start doing things like targeted home visiting and more early childhood opportunities for children and evidence-based parenting skills training, uh, things of that nature so that we don't have as many people who need to come into the system. So that's basically the, the, the overview and how we got here and what I'd like to say in terms of League of Women Voters uh, members and, and chapters, um, there's a number of things that people can do and there's some contact information at the end of the PowerPoint that's going with this. Um, but uh, one, the easiest thing to do is to sign up for our weekly policy blog. We call it an e-brief. It's very short. It takes uh, 30, 45 seconds to read, so we find people read it often. And it gives a little policy uh, insight into child welfare each week. Um, secondly, we love volunteers. It doesn't need to conflict with any other volunteer, uh, you know, commitments people have. We just go to the go to the legislature a couple of times a year, or even once a year, and maybe visit representatives in districts. 
uh, and we train people to do that and usually send them with uh, someone who's experienced the first couple of times. And we ask volunteers to e be ready to email their legislators as you do during key points in the session when things are moving through committee. Um, and then we would love opportunities to come out and uh, visit with League of Women Voters chapters and perhaps down the road even pull together a forum in different parts of the state where we invite stakeholders and elected officials to really talk about child protection issues. And we're always open to ideas in terms of other things that people would like to do. So with that, let me stop and see what kind of questions people may have uh, and I can expand on this. Thank you. And now we're going to take a few questions. Thank you, Rich, for that very informative update. Now we have a few questions from the audience. Um, the first one, I'd like you to, to talk a little bit more about the Star Tribune article series on child protection. Uh, well, it was uh, the initiative of a reporter named Brandon Stahl who first got into this, and uh, his uh, editor had said to him, well, uh, what's new to talk about in child protection? because over the years they've done a number of similar kind of investigative reporting series that, that really didn't result in reform. And uh, so he had to persuade his editor that this was worth doing, but he felt confident from what he had you know, picked up in the press and so forth that there would be a story there. So um, a couple of people referred him to, uh, to us to, uh, to Safe Passage, and, and we met with him uh, early on. I think what we contributed to is we gave him a fairly in-depth kind of briefing and understanding about how the system works, who the players are, other people we should talk to, and I think most importantly where to get the data. And there's an obscure provision in the child protection law which says that uh, any citizen can ask for a report on a, on a child fatality. And so he took it from there and um, contacted the counties for every child fatality that he could find since 2005. And it took him months of effort uh, to get those reports from the counties and to compile them uh, he did. It. He was extremely uh, tenacious about this, and that's uh, after that effort. That's where he started the series. There were about six stories in the series, uh, and it was as I said after the Eric Dean one that that people really uh, started paying attention to that. I think there's no question that we would not have had the reforms we had this year were it not for that investigative reporting series in the Star Tribune. We had done a lot of the work, to, as I said, to build up and to educate people. But then it just it took off, and so we had the opportunity to take it, uh, you know, to start really talking about reforms. Thank you. It was a very influential um, series. One other question: With all our information technology we have available to us, could you tell me if there is a statewide shared database system, or if there is plans to have one regarding child protection? One of the recommendations of the Child Protection Task Force was to uh, increase workers' access to information across counties. So up until this point, I'm not sure I have all the details down in the weeds, but my understanding is that workers could see if there had been a prior uh, report or if there was an open uh, if there was an open case in another county recently, but uh, weren't able to see the history of reports or what reports got screened in and out, what the allegations were. So they'll be able to see that. They'll, they'll do some changes to the computer system so that they'll be able to see if a family moves from one county to another to avoid uh, child protection, it'll be much easier to pick it up going forward. I, I hasten to say, I'm glad you asked that because one of the things that we did not get this year that we're going to be trying to uh, advocate for in future years is improvements to the IT systems in the state. We have a system that is very old and creaky and it's, and it's not really usable for getting the kind of management reporting or child level reporting that we need. 
but from many years of managing state and county budgets, I know that IT improvements are one of the hardest things to sell. But the reason it's really important is that if, you can, if we can update that system, every hour we save of workers' time trying to get that system to work and putting data in goes directly to more casework. And so that's really important. And also just what seems like simple things, which is to have technology in the field where you can have a laptop and they can enter the data once and not have to then go back, you know, write it down, go back and key it in. That, saves, that would save a lot of worker time. But uh, we weren't able to kind of get that in this session, so we'll be going back after it. Would that also include information for um, um, first responders, um, like the police department or others who are called to a, a potential child protection case? Uh, I don't think that police or first responders will have access to the state um, social services information system, it's called, but uh, one of the strong recommendations of the, of the task force were to develop multidisciplinary teams in counties. Uh, Stearns County has kind of the best process that we know of in Rochester, you know, Olmstead County has another, but essentially there's a, either a, a deputy sheriff or, or a sergeant from the police department, if it's, if it's a city, who sits on... Uh, who sits down generally on a daily basis with the child protection supervisor and a couple of staff people and a county attorney, and they go through all the new reports of child maltreatment that came in in the last 24 hours. So you have three sets of eyes or three organizations involved. You get better decision making. It's easier. It's not as easy to take a situation and not respond to it if it's serious enough. Uh, and often those other entities know the family and they can come up with much more nuanced uh, responses. Say the, the, the police may have uh, someone in the high school and have a relationship with one of the kids and be able to say, well, you know, how's things going? And looking. So that's something that it'll be tricky because rural areas are spread out so far that getting people together on a daily basis isn't going to work. And then in the urban areas, there's a lot of concern, particularly communities of color. If you just start sharing information back and forth with the police, that there'll be increased scrutiny that may not be appropriate. So it's really important to sit down and think through the, pro the process so that everybody knows their role and they're, they're not just getting faxes about reports over the police station and running out to see what's going on. I'm not sure if that responds completely to your question, but um, that's one of the more important recommendations from the task force. Well, along with that, is there any place that parents can turn when they're absolutely at their wit's end? That's a tough question. One of the things that happened uh, with these cuts over the years is the, the kind of infrastructure of social services uh, that are you know, in the child protection world pretty much got decimated in a lot of counties. Some counties just stopped purchasing services like um, mental health services or uh, parenting skills training and just brought everything in-house and did the best they could with their workers. So there's just not a service array out there uh, that in most cases, you know, many counties that is going to be able to respond except to uh, the most serious circumstances. Uh, there is one program that uh, the Department of Human Services got some additional money for in another part of the budget called Parent Support Outreach program and it's supposed to be for cases that are you know not quite ser serious enough to get into the child protection system historically a lot of cases that were way more serious enough than than needed to get into the system were put in this uh, parent support outreach program but that'll be expanding and that'll that when counties have gotten that money they've been able to do pretty good work with it so we're hopeful that's one piece one question from the audience is what is the range of rules laws in the counties in minnesota well, I alluded to that when I was talking about the guidelines. There, the, uh, the Department of Human Services has uh, a fairly uh, substantial, very robust uh, uh, document with guidelines for what constitutes child maltreatment, and it's uh, 15 or 20 pages long. It's based on uh, the standards from the American Humane Association and Child Welfare League of America, so it's pretty good. But what's happened historically is that counties have taken that as advice, and actually the legislative auditor used that term is that it's merely advice or suggestions uh, about what is child abuse. And so each county and tribe have more or less developed their own. And as a result, it's really gotten out of hand. So what this task force has done is we'll set up a process uh, to really thoroughly go through those guidelines, update them and upgrade them, and then uh, develop training along those lines. Uh, so I guess the short answer is there hasn't really been much order uh, to that process and to common standards and guidelines across the state, but it will, will be in the process of creating that. How much can the state mandate policies and procedures? Well, that's along the same lines. Historically, uh, there are, as I said, about 10 states. It's, some people count states one way or the other. Say roughly 10 states where the state 
uh, has a, an oversight role and the counties manage the programs. But from my experience, and I've worked in two other states with that same structure, New York State and Maryland, uh, we are way at the far end of the counties kind of taking full responsibility and the state uh, kind of providing some training and advice and best practices information, pretty hands off historically. So what this task force has done is set up some, uh, some put in some funds and set up some structures where there will be much more oversight. And so the way that the, the state could have effective oversight without you know, being burdensome will be to start collecting data on child level outcomes. That will be in feeding it back to the to the um, counties uh, and doing quality reviews. And so they will have the staff to do more quality reviews, not, uh, both in screening decisions and deeper into the case when, when they have a case plan. So those quality, re it's, they don't have the power to, in theory, they, they could find counties or something of that nature. That's probably not going to happen. What they do have is the power of information to feed it back and say, here's where you are relative to your peers or relative to the standard, and here's where you need to improve. As far as the governor's task force goes, is the task force finished with their work or are they going to continue and what is the future? What, what legislation are you going, didn't you get to cover this year that you might be looking to do next year? Well, the task force itself uh, did end on March 31st. However, uh, Representative Joe Mullery, uh, who was a member of the task force, uh, has proposed, and I believe it was passed, and, and I, uh, I haven't actually looked at it, but I understood it was passed, which would have a legislative version of this task force, smaller and not as active, but to, but to check in every, periodically with the Department of Human Services to make sure that they are following through with the recommendations. That's one piece. Uh, in addition, the recommendation of the task force were to set up several groups, one to uh, rethink the child fatality review report, make it more transparent, uh, and have more rigorous follow-up on their findings, uh, and uh, to look at the um, racial disparities grants to, to make sure they're crafted in a way that we really get some good responses, and then thirdly, to uh, go through a process, bring in some national experts, uh, and bring in stakeholders from the state to revamp the guidelines for child abuse and neglect. So those are the pieces that are continuing. Thank you. And again, I want to thank you for your work on behalf of Minnesota Children, and thank you for sharing with the League and our viewers. You can find more information about Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota by going to their Facebook page, Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota, or by going to their website and you can search Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota. Information about the League of Women Voters of the U.S., the League of Women Voters Minnesota, and about local leagues can be found on the League of Women Voters U.S. and League of Women Voters Minnesota websites and Facebook pages. And thank you to QCTV for helping the League of Women Voters to publicize the efforts being made to protect Minnesota children. Thank you. Thank you.